uh, and um, and um, we are doing this session on transformative education and citizen science and we would have with us um, Yuvan uh, who is going to share uh, his experiences and uh, uh, um, whatever he's uh, come across to all of us. Uh, but before we go ahead with that, a uh, little background about what this forum is, uh, what we do is, uh, so the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, uh, which is the larger forum, uh, is an international network of uh, 280 youth organizations from around 150 countries, um, whose common goal is to prevent the laws of biodiversity. And uh, Gibbon, which is the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, was established in 2012 in Berlin uh, and has been supported by a large number of donors, which includes the governments of Germany, Japan, Mexico, South Korea, Sweden, South Africa, Singapore, and the European Commission and the CBD Secretariat. Um, with respect to the India chapter, uh, the Gibbon India chapter was established in 2018 during the Gibbon Asia level workshop in Hyderabad. And it, it is a national network of 15 youth organizations from nine states whose common goal is to create a uh, understanding and a biodiversity network of all youth and to empower youth in nature conservation and to prevent loss of biodiversity. Um, I'm really thankful for all of you who have joined today. Um, and uh, hopefully we will have a wonderful session. Um, quick um, do's and don'ts before we go ahead. I would request whoever is joining these, uh, this session to keep their uh, microphones and their videos off as uh, until the speaker is talking. And uh, we have a question answer round. So please, if you have any question answers, do type them out into the chat box and we will take it after um, Yuvan has finished with his presentation. And uh, um, and up after that, we, we, we could have an interactive session and you can then uh, switch on your uh, microphones and videos and also ask your question personally to you one. Um, before we go ahead with the session, I wanted to gauge um, everyone who is present here about a little bit of uh, what um, education, in the present context mean to you. So we have, uh, um, uh, we have this link that we, we are gonna put on the chat box. Um, Bharat, if, uh, I just, Jonathan has put it on the chat box. So this is the question I would want all of you to respond to, which is um, what does, uh, what have you felt about the relevance of mainstream school or college curriculum for the present times? Um, so please, so scoring marks, um, sorry, yes, yes, of course, zero relevance. <laughs> um, it would be great if we have a few more uh, out, uh, like, uh, so that we know what needs flexibility, of course, it does. Yes. Theoretical and boring. More interactive, kills innovation. Z um, and Just for degree sake, true, true. Boarding, boarding, I'm guessing. Uh, so what else? We're seeing more interactive, no relevance, zero relevance, more information, enhanced our soft skills, yes. Factory produce. There's someone who's also written on the chat. So yes, completely agree uh, with 
everything that's coming in money minting yes so um thank you for your responses and we can go on to the next uh questions if if there are more okay there are more maybe we will wait for two more minutes and then we switch to the another minute or so rote memorization knowledge time boarding not practical no practical use uh wow <laughs> funny <laughs> yes we are uh, all products of this uh but i completely agree no entrepreneur skills absolutely so maybe we can move to the next question so um now that we have um gone to that what are the kind of conservation activities that uh, all of you may have been involved in um that you know different various parts so if those who have um maybe uh, been part of any painting okay planting environmental day okay research e bird lovely tree walks yes save girl child environmental friendly okay um butterfly conservation creating awareness yes training eco friendly waste segregation quiz teaching we are going to hold on to that because in some time we'll come to it <laughs> amazing uh, nature education yes composting and recycling um awareness generation speech lovely so i think uh, we have quite an active group here who has been doing a lot of things are engaging themselves uh, so the next question would be uh, bharat so if there is something you could change add modify uh, one thing about your education system today what would that be so if you were to reimagine an education system today you want something you want that change um how would you imagine your education system to be change the outdoor class <laughs> is it outdoor uh, outdoor classes field trips very good planting trees change the examination and rating patterns less assignments agree completely agree with that <laughs> field trips practical learning deeper practical learning environment progress no marking only grade less classes absolutely uh offline classes more student accordingly local biodiversity innovative learning skill based learning recognizing inner talent practical activities skill uh vocational and practical okay wow it's moving managing finances um uh, so i think there's a lot to do with less rote learning and being outside being uh, more in the environment i can see a lot 
to do with field trips, being outside, doing more practical stuff, doing things that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, picking up skills that will help us in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so I think uh, thanks, thanks uh, for all your inputs. Um, and please hold on to all of these because these are very important and Yuan is going to tell us a little bit why. But uh, thank you for these uh, inputs um, because I would request Priyansh before Yuan takes over to introduce us to who Yuan is and uh, why Yuan is here. And uh, Priyansh, over to you. Am I audible? Yes. So good evening, everyone. Today is the first session of our virtual biodiversity forum, which is based on the theme transformative education and citizen science. It is going to be taken up by Mr. Yuvan A. who, from a very long time, is working in the same area. Mr. Yuvan is a renowned writer, educator, naturalist, and activist based in Chennai. His interests include reimagining an earth-centric and a child-centric education in schools the reciprocity between languages and ecologies, and ground up processes of change and politics. He writes on the topics at the intersection of ecology, education, and human consciousness. He is the author of two books and the recipient of M. Krishnan Memorial Nature Writing Award. In pre-COVID times, he was traveling and documenting stories of biodiversity and people along the Indian coastline. The Indian Youth Biodiversity Network is honored and glad to have Mr. Yuvan here with us today. I would now request him to start the session. Thank you, Priyansh, for that. Thank you, Shruti, for that activity. I think it primes and sets, sets the tone and, uh, uh, and mood of, the, of this session. Um, I'm firstly extremely happy and grateful to be part of this group and part of this conclave uh, whose thrust is at the intersection of education and biodiversity. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yes. And can you, can you see the slides moving? Okay, good. Um, so as an educator, I am passionate about imagining um, learning and education in the broadest sense. Um, so, sometimes the idea of education is unidirectional uh, or, or, or a monologue from uh, one entity to another, and we don't think of it as reciprocal processes. Uh, and I, I've been trying to understand and imagine and practice how uh, learning and education can be child-centric, earth-centric, community-centric, and also um, mutual in a sense, reciprocal, where many voices can uh, speak and uh, participate and be listened to. So today I want to speak a little about um, how citizen science uh, can cause positive disruptions in our conventional education system and, and its scope and potential uh, to move it in directions which, which perhaps are much needed today. Um, not just as an activity or, or a project, but citizen science as a kind of a social philosophy which subverts some of the uh, you know, deeply ingrained practices in both science and education. So I want to begin with a few aspects of uh, conventional education, which I think are, are not too good, are, are detrimental, especially they, they add to feed to the kind of crisis we face today uh, in society. For instance, there's a nexus we often don't talk about, but it's, it's uh, at the backdrop and uh, a lot of edu educational thinkers have 
uh, spoken about this. It is that the industrial forces, the, the co colonization forces, also envision the kind of education and scientific practice we see largely in practice today. Um, this, the same forces which kind of took over uh, lands, uh, created um, and exacerbated a lot of uh, you know, ecological and social crisis we see today, uh, also imagined and, and set in stone uh, the educational processes we see. So, and, and there are a lot of points of problems for that. And I want to just uh, mention a few. Um, if, if you look at uh, a child in, in school, you know, right from kindergarten till up to class 12, uh, uh, they would have sat passively, uh, sat sedentarily, uh, listening to instructions, told not to ask questions to authority um, and be obedient for a period of about 12,000 to 15,000 hours throughout their schooling. But uh, if you read Anders Ericsson's work, for instance, a psychologist who did his work on expertise, he shows that if anybody practices something for 10,000 hours, you become a kind of a world expert on that. You know, if, if somebody is playing tennis or somebody is a writer or a musician, you practice, deliberately practice that for about 10,000 hours, then you, you are one of the best in that. So um, I'm asking um, how education hardwires into us passivity, into, into children um, over, over a period of 12 years, 15 years, uh, far more than 10,000 hours of passive sitting. Well, what would be uh, implications of that? For instance, when somebody uh, moves out of school or, or, or faces something in society or a forest is being cut down, a lake is being encroached, I practice for the most formative period of my life not to ask questions, uh, to sit silently, to just do what I'm told. How will I question? How, how, how will I be an agent of change? How can I contribute to community? Yeah. Um, the other thing is monoculture. Uh, what that essentially means is that if you look at, you know, there's a beautiful word in the language of Quechua um, in, in the Amazonian tribes. It's called Aki Numage. Now, Aki means earth. Numage means to draw wisdom from, to, to ask a direction for. And, and what that really means is that uh, a lot of native tribes have these words where they draw their values and belief systems and, and pedagogies from ecological processes and what keeps them uh, resilient and stable because uh, we are part of that, that rich network of, of life. Um, and one, one very basic ecological truth, and it's uh, true for society as well, is that the most diverse ecosystems or the more diversity there is in, in a habitat, the more resilient it is, uh, the more stable it is, uh, and so on. But schooling um, does a form of monoculture. You know, the same metaphor of farming can apply here. It treats certain capacities certain people, certain skills as uh, valued. And then it builds, you know, what has been called an academic caste hierarchy, as it were. Um, learning spaces in a conventional sense are seldom uh, places of diversity, like, like a forest or, or, or like a coral reef, um, where there is so much, uh, you know, cross-pollinatory interaction and, and space and inclusivity of various kinds of perceptions. Um, that's really a challenge uh, in education where, 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 where there is a kind of a discrimination, uh, uh, disenfranchisement as, as it were to kind of say certain things are not valued, are not important and certain things are valued not because they have real uh, importance in life or in, uh, in one's outward or inward life, but the fact that it is valued in the larger economic system. 
in the profit of 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 that uh, the, the 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 larger system as it were. Um, now there there is an interesting study by um, uh, educational researcher called uh, Yveta Silova. She did it in twenty twenty, and I would kind of strongly recommend uh, people uh, go read that. And it's about how education is based on individualism, which is my identity is strongly what I consider myself and the land or my larger community or uh, the local geography I'm part of is not, not part of my embodied felt identity. Uh, you know, there is a, you, you find a lot of examples, but then I, I, I'm I able to think of a story where um, the Laps tribe in Norway, um, there was a dam being built in the river and they started uh, going there and breaking the dam apart. And then they were arrested and produced in court. And the judge is supposed to have asked them, you guys aren't supposed to do this, you know, why are you doing this? And they said, uh, the reason they gave was that the, they were being hurt. But they weren't being hurt. The river was being hurt. But then in their philosophy, the river was a philosophical or, or a spiritual part of themselves. And that's something so difficult even to think about when we've grown up in uh, in an urban society. So uh, Iveta Silva, uh, Silva's work, what she looks at is that um, educational systems where there is a strong sense of individualism and uh, it's built upon competition and one-upmanship, you know, that is really the driving force for our kind of progress within schools. They are the ones who have greater environmental impacts and social divisions. And interestingly, she links it to how she calls it, uh, she gives it a name, she calls it ontological individualism, which is, you know, from a very young age, uh, you find that you are yourself and you got to fend yourself uh, from the rest of society uh, and, and, and you're alone and so on. But, but the community and the land is not part of your identity um, as it were in say wasps or ants so, um, in, in a metaphoric sense. And she finds that those communities are affected far more by COVID than, than communities held together in, in, in ties of community. Um, the, the other last thing would be that um, a kind of an insulation and isolation from what is actually going on in our in a, in a local and global sense. If you look at other kinds of, you know, there are hundreds of models of education and knowledge systems in the world. And we here largely talking about one. And, and of course, whenever, whenever I'm referring to education or, or the system, I'm talking about uh, conventional uh, a Western kind of an educational system. But then you look at the Australi Australian Aboriginal tribes, for instance, when a child turns 16, a rite of passage is, is won by the child going out into the bush, into the forest, and being there and being able to survive there for six months. And then they come back, and then there is a kind of celebration of, of that uh, of having achieved that period uh, and then an induction into the tribe. Uh, I've been working uh, recently a lot with fisher folk uh, uh, along the Tamil Nadu coast and also other parts of India. And one beautiful thing you see there uh, is by the age of three or even five, children are accompanying their parents, their kin on their boats far into the ocean. Um, and, and you, you see this in all other kinds of uh, indigenous communities that that there is in the learning, the subject, uh, the the actual uh, topic of learning is the teacher itself. Uh, the ocean is the teacher. The the forest is the teacher. The community is the teacher. While in our uh, in this uh, you know mainstream education, there's this strange. Uh, irony of an insulation, actually, an externalization of what the real world is and, and a kind of arresting away into a cubicle um, from uh, matters of, of 
community, society, governance, environment, and so on. Uh, and, and throughout our learning, there's very little actual ongoing and, and meaningful participation with the actual world. Um, I mean, I, I just wanted to show these two pieces of art, uh, two campaigns, uh, we've been very actively, uh, has been active recently in Chennai. Uh, and they've been spearheaded by youth and children uh, to a very large extent. And that's just to uh, uh, exemplify that youth are an extraordinary uh, transformative agent, an agent of, of, of change in society uh, because of the energy and, and, and that uh, what that period of growth is. You know, uh, there is curiosity, there is questioning, there is reimagining. Uh, there is subversion, there is dissent, and those are uh, perhaps thermometers, uh, uh, health factors of, of, of a healthy society, um, of uh, a society which is evolving, perhaps. So uh, uh, these two are just uh, art done by children for two campaigns, Pulikat and Vedandangal. Um, and recently, uh, Pulikat uh, Lagoon, which is actually threatened by uh, Adani Port, uh, the public hearing was cancelled by the collector because of uh, a children's campaign, uh, really. A lot of schools in Chennai made art, uh, put their signatures together and uh, sent it to the chief minister, the collector and uh, other uh, role holders. And the kind of pressure they were able to generate uh, put a real... Uh, you know, spanner in the works for uh, the, the entities trying to push this uh, project. So, so in my experience, in, in uh, other kinds of campaigns you see, youth and children are very, very valuable contributing agents of society. But then mainstream education kind of pushes that, you know, makes, makes that gestation period unmeaningful. And, and isolates them from actually being valuable contributors to what's happening around them. Yeah. Now, um, coming to um, citizen science uh, and how it can be integrated in a uh, school curriculum and, and why it should be and the kind of disruptions it, could, it can cause based on some of the things we saw earlier. Um, one thing we don't often talk about science is that it happens in specific socio-political contexts. The way it is practiced is influenced by um, the, the prevailing cultural soil. And uh, we do, in, in school, we learn about science as if it were a set, stagnant uh, you know, uh, body of facts. But then you look at any kind of knowledge system, knowledge systems are evolving. Uh, communities, people interact with knowledge systems and, and they, they question it, they create chinks in it, they add to it, they, they let it evolve. And the direction of evolution is often determined by the, the larger cultural belief systems, cultural values, uh, and so on. Um, you know, one uh, example uh, I, I often think of is uh, recently, I don't know how many of you have heard about the wood wide web um, discovered by Susan Simard, the fact that trees can speak with each other, uh, pass on different kinds of information, a kind of a uh, tree internet network under the soil. The kind of science used for that, she used radio nucleides, put it in the soil and uh, tracked what where they went to, not tree to tree. That was discovered in the 90s, but then the science of that, the using of radionuclides was uh, discovered in the 1920. Uh, but then in that period of science, there was building of armaments. There was other kinds of directions where science progressed towards. But then the you know, questions appear from the cultural soil. Somebody, if they had in the 20s or the 30s, did they have the space to ask, can trees speak to each other? It, 
maybe it wouldn't have gotten funded it wouldn't have been taken seriously so it needed a kind of a cultural shift actually precedes uh the practice of uh science and and the directions in which uh it goes so uh, as opposed to uh you know a normal scientific practice which is top down which means that science is practiced in the big institutions by 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 people who are uh, trained and then the rest of society is seen as an inert material a kind of a passive medium onto which uh science is subjected onto you know um uh, citizen science completely subverts that citizen science is ground up which means it is a, a philosophy of science where everybody can participate you can be a child you can be um anybody in from any section of society and there is space to participate access data um and it it comes with its extraordinary um benefits one could say uh, it's been found that uh, especially in ecology and we are here at a biodiversity conclave um the kind of data gathering uh, over the spatial and uh, temporal uh, you know expanses which has been made possible has never been uh, so in science before when when science was practiced in you know small uh, groups of of elite institutions um you know uh, I, there is a complex system scientist called Brad Werner and he, his work is uh, one more thing i think people concerned about these things uh, should read about and his work is interesting he what he works with is that he takes prevalent cultures in the world the political systems the various movements and then he looks at how it shifts uh the 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 you know different societies in the world and he projects them onto different time scales okay if if uh, extractivist or capitalist economy were to go ahead let's and and let's say if we were to project its patterns 200 years into the future what would it be like and then he finds that the only way in which a future scenario in which the ecological crisis we uh, we are facing today the biodiversity crisis uh, other kinds of global issues we are facing today is reversed is when there is ground up action or or action and and disruptions and and movements which uh emerge from uh people common people public so active citizenry is is something citizen science uh encourages and that's i think that's something radical and revolutionary and and in line with uh, you know what people like brad warner are, are finding um so um and and the last point is an important one uh, often science is treated as an objective thing where you know the famous scientist richard feynman uh, possibly there are a lot of uh, fans of him here uh, and you know at a point in time when i was studying physics um i loved his lectures but then he was part of creating the nuclear bomb and then a uh, journalist are supposed to have asked him um so you know you created extraordinary destruction uh, in the world you know what do you feel like you know though he said that those are not things scientists think about there was good science to be done and i did it um from that uh the the philosophy of citizen science uh takes into account human and ecological values and uh and i i think that's something radical as well um well uh these are some just to give you an idea of the the, the range of and, and the scope of various citizen science platforms you know citizen science can be something a group of people can come together a group of children can come together um and and create and then the basis of citizen science is knowledge making through community participation through through public participation um that is that is really the kind of theoretical requisite for something to be called uh, citizen science um and and especially in ecology um the number of things which are being discovered and and uh the new findings which 
pour into a lot of these global citizen science platforms or even on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis is extraordinary to watch. Uh, let's just look at a few examples. Um, uh, I, I see some friends from NCF uh, and eBird, uh, I think are present here. Um, a state of India's birds, um, which was able to assess the conservation status of over 800 species of birds from over 10 million observations on the citizen science platform called eBird. So eBird, if uh, anybody is unfamiliar with, is a citizen science platform on the internet. You can go and uh, you can use it as a reference to understand, uh, you know, in what place, what birds are found. Uh, but also when you go to a place and you make your bird checklist, you can put it up there and then you're actually contributing to science. And, and that's something beautiful to think about. So some, uh, right from a five-year-old to, to a forest ranger, to an amateur, to a, uh, you know, a actual scientist can actually uh, contribute to this platform. So uh, the, the kind of results, the state of India's birds uh, report, uh, it's, it, I think it's freely downloadable on, on the website, uh, on their website. Um, couldn't have been uh, funded or uh, enabled if it was taken up by one or few scientific uh, institutions or universities uh, where scientists go and uh, practice uh, and, 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 and gather this kind of data. Uh, it was possible because common, normal people were able to contribute uh, to this cause. Um, now, there are a lot of friends I have in premier wildlife institutions, they do something called an EIA, which means somebody wants to do a project, they want to build a dam or a factory or a, or a road. They got to go and assess what that environment is like, what damage it's going to cause to that place. And then uh, a lot of these people, you know, they might not tell you uh, straight on the face, but then uh, what is true and what I hear from uh, friends uh, who, who are part of this process is that they have to tinker their EIAs to suit the uh, interest of the project, um, uh, of the factory. So, so they often do not portray the whole truth. They will leave out species which are perhaps protected under various laws so that it doesn't cause a legal issue um, and so on. So we, we are, uh, as, as an activist, uh, and amongst activist groups, we face this again and again and again. We, we, we take a campaign uh, and, and we, we, we delve into the EIA of that, uh, let's say, specific place. And we find that, you know, for instance, take Vedandangal Bird Sanctuary. Uh, we find about 200 species of birds there. But then the EIA of uh, the company threatening that bird sanctuary right now, Sun Pharma, uh, shows 25 species of birds there. Uh, and it's uh, India's oldest bird sanctuary. But then citizen science say, was able to back our ca campaign. Uh, we could show, we could disprove the AIA saying, hey, look, 200 species of birds are found there. Your EIA is faulty and, and illegal uh, and so on. Um, another way in which uh, in India and other parts of the world, uh, data from citizen science is being used to push conservation law policy. Uh, I mean, there are multiple examples. You take the Fraser River Delta, for instance, in British Columbia, it's a Ramsar site. And based on people going there and observing the migratory birds there and putting up their observations, um, that place, the area of that Ramsar site was expanded 50 times. Similarly, uh, state parks in Florida, in the US, they uh, people putting up observations about nesting birds made the state pass a law about not flying drones in that, uh, in that entire state because it's disturbing uh, protected uh, species uh, and so on. So, and, and, and the other thing is that uh, uh, a question, um, the philosophy of citizen science poses is that uh, do we all have unique knowledge, important knowledge to contribute to society, and can we participate? You know the uh, you know, uh, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights calls uh, and defines 
science as some as, as an endeavor everybody should be able to participate in is that possible in uh, the kind of science which which is uh, top down you know people like madhav gadgil uh, have written about how conservation is not possible if it's pushed from the top but then it needs to emerge from the bottom so there are some brilliant citizen science initiatives for instance oxfam is finding out how um farmer communities can build resilience by um by growing diverse crops and and, and they are part of this huge citizen science project in, including uh, about 25000 farmers across india and they are experimenting different kinds of uh, local seed varieties in in different combinations and they are uh contributing to the knowledge of uh what different landscapes uh can do for their food sovereignty there are there are projects where fisher folk are monitoring important parameters of oceans of uh fisheries uh and then adding to our knowledge of of how to manage them uh better there is uh, there is another just to give another example um coral reefs the monitoring of marine ecosystems coral reefs especially uh, dakshin foundation in india they have something called reef log where people who go diving um um actually also based on what way they see under the water they come and share their observation that's creating a kind of a database um um I, just to kind of move on uh, from there uh, possibly there are a lot of teachers and, and and young people and educators in this space and i want to share um how i've attempted to integrate uh, citizen science as a, both as activity but also as a value system uh, within uh, within school curriculum so what you're seeing here is actually a class 8 uh, standard 8 groups project um and what they were interested in is they actually said this in our citizen science module they came up and said so we used to see mongooses um, uh, a lot when we were young and we don't see them now we, let's can we create a map can we ask um, people where they see mongooses kind of understand uh, where they prefer to live and so on and what they did was um, they they sent out a form which people could fill in uh, put their uh, mongoose data uh, you know where, where where they are found um, if they had pictures uh, to upload it and the date and so on basic details and if they had offspring or not they saw uh, saw the mongoose with babies or not and then they took all that i think they had about um, till now 60 data points from chennai and then they plotted it on a map and then they found something fascinating and this proves how a class 8 child can actually contribute to science and this is something as a naturalist i did not know of or, or had read about all the mongoose sightings were clustered around water bodies in chennai and you can kind of see that largely 90% of the sightings are clustered around the marshes at the adyar river and and other kinds of water bodies now and what the, the point this kind of proves is that children can actually generate scientific knowledge and be valuable contributors to society as they learn not after 12 years 15 years and uh, and, and 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 losing that formative period uh and and, and then think about that later um just a couple of more examples uh, another girl uh, who did this very interesting project on she wanted to understand how many trees um a com a normal urban uh, school going child can identify a a, a, a urban tree uh, in chennai and so she made a form uh, where we you know with, with leaves and and with a uh, picture of the tree and then uh, children had to identify them and she collected some very important data which i didn't know about and i've not read about is that on average and, and i think she had about 50 responses from different schools in chennai uh, an average urban child can identify about three species of trees of she had put about 10 very common species uh, an average child can identify 
only three species of trees and um, that goes on to say a lot to to name is to actually have a relationship with something it's very difficult to love something you cannot put a name to um and and to actually have a to allow that entity to be an active part of your imagination so if 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 at at 12 13 16 a child only knows three species of trees its implications are huge if there is a park being cut down or there is there are uh, because of highway expansion there are trees being cut down on either side and if they are uh, there is loss of habitat and because there is not this eco literacy uh, and, and knowing those species it wouldn't even be part of the child's reality it would be another thing which is happening on the side it, it it wouldn't be you know a blow to the heart but then just a incident on the periphery um I, i'll give you one more example of um um the, there were there are a lot of other ways in which we found that children can actually generate knowledge which we had no clue about another group wanted to find out uh, the perceptions of people about snakes uh in uh in a city in in chennai and very interestingly uh and and where they form it from and people who find uh, snakes are terrible creatures she found that i informed by by movies you know not surprisingly but then the data was clear and also that younger people children were actually far more fascinated by snakes and they are interested and they don't want to kill them but then as you grow up there is a kind of a conditioning which happens and and then people uh, start having uh, averse reactions to uh, reptiles and snakes so so th- those are examples of knowledge contributed by created by children practicing science where public contribution uh, and community engagement is its basis and in the process they end up interacting with a whole bunch of people from all sections of society come to know of realities which they may not be part of uh, and then end up forming questions uh, which then take them on various kinds of parallel and tangential learnings which perhaps school itself cannot offer um this this is just to give you an another example of a great uh, citizen science platform it's called i naturalist and this is our group called biodiversity of chennai and one of the uh, primary intentions of starting this group was that to all schools in chennai anybody wants to identify a, a bird or a insect or a fungi or a tree we wanted to put in here all those species so that you can go in here search and you will get it so you will be able to know the names of almost every living thing you share your your locality with and right now we have uh, 2006 over 2600 species and it's uh, adding and it's a powerful thing and it's it's a place where people can contribute people can access data uh, people can uh, create um, what you call um, analyze what is there and and um infer from that and we are also finding that this data is helping us fight campaigns uh you know if if, if there is a highway going through a, a forest or or there is a project which will encroach a lake uh data from here contributed by all kinds of people um is is helping us so um so to me uh, in a, in a kind of a summary uh, these are the most powerful things uh, citizen science as a philosophy offers it especially in schooling it allows for young people to not be consumers so a, a top down system is required to create a consumeristic society the common public needs to be pushed down as um inert material passive recipients of of science of economy of other kinds of of services but then in a very powerful way citizen science subverts this as say it makes the citizenry proactive and then they are they are 
evolvers of knowledge systems and it allows young people to be agents of change when they are 12 16 18 20 or uh, and so on so that, that i think that's one of the most powerful ways citizen science can allow education to uh, trans transform and and other beautiful things uh, it it does is it it connects one to the local ecology and community uh, how many people can identify 20 trees within one uh, say square kilometer of their radius um, you, you know very few people um, in 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 an urban culture but but th this practice has actually uh, i've seen uh, transform the kind of knowledge and connect uh, to biodiversity to local biodiversity um, so to i want to read this poem by nicolas sauda which kind of really captures the essence of what the philosophy of citizen science uh, and how it can positively disrupt uh, our, our uh, mainstream education curriculum. So she says, may we raise children who love the unloved things, the dandelion, the worms and spiderlings, children who sense the rose needs the thorn and run into rain swept days the same way they turn towards sun. And when they are grown and someone has to speak for those who have no voice, may they draw upon that wilder bond those days of tending tender things and be the ones. Yeah, thank you. So um, those are some of the ideas I wanted to share and I'll stop uh, sharing my screen now. Um, thank you, Yuvan. I'll be open to questions. Um, that was very, like, it was just wonderful. Um, all your experiences, those stories, and it's, really awe-inspiring what if a person can put their mind to it and if younger if you broaden and be a little more flexible and give people chance what they can do and the wonders that they can do um so we do have a lot of questions uh, uh we the first question uh, is from um I'm, I'm, uh, i apologize in advance if i get any of the names wrong but it's from KPP Shravani. Uh, is she here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can ask your question, uh, what you've asked in the chat box. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, so my question is that uh, in making uh, new educational policies in India, do environmentalists have a role in making those, I mean, their voices are concerned or not? If they are not concerned, why those voices are not being heard? So do environmentalists also play a role in transforming education rights? Sir? So I think they should have, they, their voices should be heard, sir. If, if I understand your question and statement right, are shouldn't environmentalists be involved in, in creating a educational policy? Um, see, what, what, what my response to that would be, um, you know, centralized education does not work uh, at all. And that's something uh, we should uh, try and reimagine. For instance, if uh, everybody is here has been through the geography textbooks uh, and other textbooks. You learn about the Ganges and the Yamuna. Do you learn about the local rivers in your cities? I did not. Um, so uh, I think the fact that education is a federal subject uh, in our constitution is, is very healthy. But then you also see uh, the pattern of it becoming more uh, center driven than it being federal. So that, that uh, makes it not so healthy. It removes a uh, connection of uh, children to their socio-political context, their immediate geographies, localities, um, and, and so on. So uh, 
there cannot be one there could be a policy yes a very overarching policy but then there should be a hundred different or thousand different models of education in india the kind of bio geographic diversity we have and and uh, ethnic diversity uh, we have um for one policy to be able to cater to that that gamut of uh of realities is is impossible so yeah i, I think a, a, a policy a policy should spring in in different places in in a, a thousand different ways and that that might be a more um that might be a better thing yeah thank yeah. you sir thank you um i'm so glad you one you brought up the example of trees um because and whether in trees uh, have emotions the the study that you mentioned because we do have someone rishita shri uh rishita shri and um, she asked a very uh, important question which also also made me think so rishita would you want to ask the question yourself Is Rishita here? Yeah. So actually, I am going to ask my question now, sir. Yes. Sir, why the river getting polluted affects only few, but not all the trees next to it or surrounded by it, sir? Interesting question, Rishita. So you are in school, or you are from? Uh... Hey, can you tell a bit about yourself? I am Rishita sir from Saint Michael School, seventh A grade. Okay, um, so I'll kind of quickly answer your question from whatever knowledge I might have. I might not give you the right question. Google may able to, may be able to give you a better uh, response. Um, um, from what I've been doing recently, so there are species called mangroves. and we've been trying to map mangroves across uh, the, the northern section of tamil nadu where they are and one of the things they do is they can draw out heavy metals and salt from the water and keep it in them and then sometimes push it uh, out of their the pores on their leaves uh, and then they are, they have a, a kind of an internal uh, water treatment system Uh, as it were um and as some plants have that uh and for mangroves uh, i do know uh, know about that but then you i don't think uh i'm an expert at that so i you should pursue that question uh in in other places as well so okay thank you sir yeah, thank you uh, so we have uh, one question uh, ravi uh, uh, ravi chellam who's asked ravi would you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, hi you one uh, my question is really what's been your experience in trying to change parents attitudes towards education and career options for their children um, i mean i i'm a wildlife biologist i was lucky with my parents uh, way back in the 80s who allowed me to pursue ecology um, what has been your more recent experience yeah i think that's a um, complex question and from my experience it's it's a mix of uh, feelings i'm having um i i teach in an alternate school so i've i've studied in krishnamurthy schools i've taught in a krishnamurthy school uh, i right now work uh, in a montessori school and then uh, i also do workshops in in largely in alternative setups uh so the kind of parents who come to these schools share some most often a kind of vision a different kind of growing up uh, for their child but then you also see parents who are deeply conditioned uh into what well being means what a good life means uh and so on and then there is a a very active um you know transferring of that ideology onto the child and 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 you see the dynamics of that uh stressing out uh, children and uh, and and blow and that blowing up in different ways um 
so you you know actually we we do something called uh, what we call it now is earth farm society curriculum uh, in our school and there have been a lot of parents who have embraced it and and said you know what, what a wonderful thing there have been a lot of parents who also come up and said can you reduce the number of trips and and uh, projects you are doing in this curriculum put more focus on the exams and they've been very very uh, vocal in saying that so we we face both those uh, both ends of those spectrum but then perhaps a, a personal thing is that there is a kind of a change in in attitude uh, towards a more uh, holistic positive uh, uh, direction at least in the uh communities i am uh, interacting with circles i am interacting with thank you thank you ravi um next we have uh, priyansh hello sir sir i want to ask uh, that should the citizen science and its ideals be introduced in the existing course curriculum in schools or it should be introduced with some other changes and if it should be introduced with some other changes what shall they be okay so yeah a, a broad uh, question um so if you look at reimagining of reforming of education it, uh, you can look at it in a, a lot of different ways and one there was one portal into that was the philosophy citizen science is offering some sometimes i talk to uh, groups of teachers about passivity um we just as an example just to kind of elucidate that various kinds of things need need rethinking reimagining we think that learning happens when we sit silently and listen but then there is a lot of research showing that movement equates to learning that if you sit passively you don't learn i use sedentary lifestyles are bad for our brains and mental health um and then we've been through that for 15 years now what what would that uh, do to the the collective mental health of of the you know, places we live in that would and 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 so to reimagine how we learn and to uh create diverse ways of 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 learning would be one way or uh, towards thinking about reform, reformation uh the the most powerful idea one of the most powerful idea citizen science brings into education curriculum uh at whatever level it may uh it can uh i mean it can be added, it can be added at a you know large national policy level it can be added in different ways but then the powerful idea it, it brings in is that children need to be active participants of their environment and society and matters of politics governance etc so so you know the educational philosopher john holt speaks about this i think the tragedy of mainstream education is that learning is different from doing you know learning is different from living so you have this little cubicle of of a room where you go learn and then you come out and then you live real life um uh, to to actually kind of hack that gap uh is citizen science as as a philosophy allows for those those chinks those perforations to happen uh in, in my experience i hope i uh, answered that question to some extent thank you sir uh we have uh, sindura they want to hi you won that was a really nice talk i just wanted to know on the flip side how receptive are schools towards incorporating citizen science or any such uh you know um environmental science which is active form of learning into the school curriculum yeah uh, that's that's a good question uh, and it it depends on what the value of a school is what are my values you know for instance um as a community we can ask 
what do I stand for? What are what is my core intention? You have these large schools with four thousand, ten thousand children, and uh, it runs by an industrial setup. If if it runs through profit making, through producing extremely high mark scorers, those values do not allow for these kinds of integrations to happen. So the the receptivity of a uh, institution strongly steeped in uh, such values would be nil. While um, uh, the alternative schools are act uh, are extremely receptive to uh, re rethinking education because these schools were set up by people who either went through uh, education and said this is not it. You know we need a different kind of or or if you think of the the big educational reformers. Uh, of our time, you know, Krishnamurti or Montessori or Steiner or Paul of Fred, the institutions, they they all lived through the world wars and, and they said we, we need a different kind of schooling system. And so the values of the places they built were starkly different. They were, they focused on the well-being of the child, the well-being of the community and so on. So the receptivity would be based on the value system of the school. And, and sometimes we aren't even aware of the, what our values are and, and there's not an active review and, and, and discussion of, of, of values, of, of processes. Um, Shruti, yeah. can follow up question? Uh, as an educator, would you even uh, consider approaching the, uh, you know, the schools which don't have those value systems, like who are more mainstream and things like that? Would you try to open up a dialogue and try to convince them about, you know, how important such initiatives are. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've done that. So, you know, talks and workshops uh, and, and also to engage in a, a kind of a mainstream educational activism and, and, and creating a, a kind of a, um, an awareness about these things uh, and and for different people to be able to articulate what the issues with conventional education are, is. But then the ex my experience with, uh, you know, very, very large institutions, which are very, very main, uh, you know, conventional in, in, in their educational pedagogy, they might be res receptive, but then they peripheralize these kinds of things. For instance, Schools offer environmental education. You know, David Orr talk, talks about how all education needs to be environmental education because everything happens in within the the the, the, the network of ecology. But then a lot of schools, uh, at least in Chennai and perhaps uh, rest of India, if a child is not able to learn maths or science, then there is environmental education. So 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 the the very view into the importance of ecological literacy is is strange uh, and and uh, sometimes not very hopeful in in, in different places. Um, yeah, that that would be my response. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Indira. Uh, next, we have Usha. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, sir. My question is, sir, uh, do you think uh, we we do uh, we have value based schools? As you were talking about the values, do you think we still have uh, uh, values uh, value based schools where they try to teach or incorporate everything, whatever is necessary for the child to grow as a human being rather than running behind the maths? You know, the Maoris of New Zealand they have a beautiful value in in their uh, the way they envision education and their word for that is ako and ako means reciprocal learning so nobody is a teacher or a learner but then all everybody is a participant in the vast conversation of of knowledge making and learning so the teacher is actually a student to the child in in observing and uh, and understanding how learning happens as much as a student 
uh, is a student to to somebody who is experienced in a certain field. That that is a nuance very few conventional schools do not have. So, you know, we look at children as inert material, uh, you know, like blank slates, and and to, to be kind of filled in, uh, you know, in a very in, a industrial sense. But then, you know, I've I've been in uh, education for ten years, and I based on what I've, I've I've experienced and read from very young. children come with an extraordinary sense of purpose and and agency and curiosity steep in real world issues uh in in ways which is a challenge for us to accommodate within a single space um so there are a lot of institutions uh which which i imagining this kind of of uh, of a value system you know i i can name a few you know the, the montessori schools the krishnamurthy schools various kind of alternative schools bhumi college uh, barefoot uh, you know sikshantar barefoot college uh, in india there are a whole lot i am sure shruti knows more um um yeah the, the number is uh, the numbers are increasing so um, so there are such places such oases of of um yeah one more doubt sir sir the uh, the kind of importance we give uh, uh, let it be the transportation or the communication right from the pre kg itself we teach the children all uh, everything about the materialistic worlds whatever uh, the human made uh, creativity and all then don't you think that even to teach children about the nature as we are the tenants of this particular mother earth don't you think that it is important for us to incorporate this kind of education because now environmental studies is sort is something like uh, is taught like a subject Le and to be frank it is something like an alternative subject not even a main subject which is taught like uh, something like math and uh, sciences so don't you think that environmental studies should be given importance right from the young age so that the children at least will look at uh, look at the nature as we used to do in our childhood days do you think the children of the present generations are looking at the same kind way as we used to in our childhood days so where are we uh, where are we going wrong i this is what uh, it's it's something like a sort of a doubt which i have and i couldn't find out the reason why and what is it going wrong to the present generation that they don't even look at the tea trees though we talk to them though we tell them that that is important they hardly try to spend a little time and more to the let it be the gadgets or the tvs or whatever it is so what do you think is where are we going wrong sir with with this um So I think you've raised several important points, and um, I don't know if I want to articulate it as we are going wrong, but then I I want to uh, give it an alternative view. So one is to think about that we should learn about trees and 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 you know, rivers and and creatures because we are tenants as such of this planet. But then there are some there's some extraordinary work, for instance, by Richard Loop. Some of you might have read Last Child in the Woods. Um, Gail Melson, Peter Kahn, these people, psychologists, uh, educational researchers, have found that immersion in nature, especially in between when child is very young, between zero to seven years of age, is very important for the cognitive, emotional, uh, social development of the child. So one is that uh, you know. we teach nature to the child because it's important for nature as importantly we it's important for the child and there's some beautiful research on that i strongly recommend this book called children and nature edited by peter kahn there is a collection of uh, essays from various educators around the world of the importance of uh, you know immersive ecological learning for the profound well being of the child um yeah 
and and there's one more paper which which uh, I'll I'll just mention that it's, it's called uh, childhood pathways into adult environmentalism, and um, it's 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 a beautiful study because the what they try to understand is that what creates environmental values when you grow up, what kind of childhood experiences allows for somebody to stand up for your forest, for your park, for your river. Um, and, and very interestingly, so they have a sample size of 2000 children uh, and, and their narratives, uh, adults who, who kind of spoke about what they went into, uh, went through in childhood. And they find that immersion in nature or tending to animals created environmental values, a kind of a sensorial connect, uh, a multi-sensorial connect was extremely important. While pure fact learning created no environmental values, it had a zero correlation with adults developing environmental values. So that's just to highlight one of the things you mentioned. Yeah. Um, Thank thanks, uh, Usha. Um, we will take Thank you, questions. sir. We'll take two more questions um, and then uh, we can. Um, so, yeah, Badri Narayanan. Is Badri Narayanan here? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wanted to know whether is there any uh, similarity between the olden day uh, Gurukula schools and the alternative schools of uh, these times? Can you? Uh, I couldn't fully hear. Yeah. No, I couldn't yeah, fully catch that. Day, Gurukula schools, Gurukula schools, have you heard of? Uh, yes, yes. Where uh, I believe the uh, the uh, students also stayed along with their uh, teacher uh, and uh, participate in all the day-to-day -day activities of the uh, school or the residence, and then uh, that's how they learn. I mean, can you compare that with the uh, alternative schools of uh, uh, present-day alternative schools? Any uh, similarity between them? Um, yeah, one similarity I would uh, see straight away is that they're small groups. You know, a lot of uh, child-centric, uh, you know, humane educational institutions are small. In fact, there's a school called Small School run by Satish Kumar uh, in England, which, which has about, I think, 40 children or something like that. You know, there's something called the Dunbar number uh, in, in psychology. And if, if uh, a community, if a place needs to be a community where we have good relationships with each other uh, and we know everybody's names and we are able to interact and converse and, and, and have a bond amongst us, numbers need to be about, uh, you know, within... Uh, units of that group or as the group as a whole between 120 to 150. Um, that's just one, one narrative to it. It could vary a little bit this way, that way. But then I think uh, space is, uh, an educational space is most diverse where children can learn in, in their own paces, in their own ways, uh, be active participants of the curriculum itself there are such spaces when the numbers are small when you have a class which has 200 people so so in a gurukula system also you know there would be the teacher and there would be a small group of children and 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 the interactions would be deep and immersive um but then if you have a classroom with 200 children it's simply not uh possible um that that's one uh parallel i see uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question we have um, is from uh, Jaya. Yeah, hi. Uh, oh, sorry, before Jaya uh, takes over, um, a lot of people are asking for um, all the uh, names of the authors and papers that you've quoted. Um, so is there any place where you could, or you could send it to us and we can send it to the rest of the group? Um, yes, I, I can do that. Uh, so please uh, do write to us and uh, we, we, we'll share um, all these um, things. I'll put our email IDs in the chat box and we can share uh, whatever Yuvan has mentioned here. And uh, also to let you know that uh, this is also going to be put up on YouTube. 
So if anyone wants to go back to this talk and kind of note down whatever Yuvan has uh, mentioned, the papers and things to read, uh, they can also do the same. So uh, Yuvan, you can also um, send us the list of things that people can read. Sure. Jaya, over to you. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll put my question there. Yuvan, I also teach in a Krishnamurti school at present. And uh, whether it's 200 or 20 or two, right now teaching in the online mode has really put a spin on things. I mean, when you say, uh, you know, the, the kind of education that we envisage, uh, working with it, uh, with children being at home or uh, even teachers, uh, last year, many of them have not even stepped out of the portals of their home uh, over the past year. So how, how do we now uh, engage with this? Uh, how do we, uh, in this working in this mode and for the foreseeable few months, it's going to continue like this. But we don't know when children will come back to campus or some semblance of uh, the, the, the way we teach and learn. So, so what do you think it's, I mean, one is the ongoing impacts on the children themselves but, and teachers, but how do we make use of the months ahead of us in a constructive way? You know, I, I don't have a, a good answer for that. I, I think uh, I am in as much as a tussle uh, as, as uh, any other teacher would be. And I'm, I'm, we are thinking very hard to uh, understand how we can create a, a learning frame, which is meaningful, especially uh, during this time. And perhaps some of the opportunities uh, it might offer. Um, you know, one of the things... Uh, I'm doing, for instance, is I just finished uh, a little fauna guide uh, of 140 species, which children will be able to see around their apartments, you know, birds mm. and ants and wasps and, uh, you know, very spiders, other kinds of things they can see inside their homes and right around. And I'm getting that and passing it off to all the older uh, primary children, you know, the uh, four to uh, five years of age. Uh, sending seeds to different children so they can grow and harvest and, uh, you know, to those who have space. But um, it, it, for the major fact, is it's a challenge. But then for the teacher, I think the opportunity it gives is that we are no longer the source of knowledge. The internet knows vastly more than what any of us can know. So then it our roles, uh, we are kind of intelligently kind of rethinking. So I'm now more thinking about frames of learning rather than be a, so I'm, I'm you know, for, for the last few years, I'm, I'm no longer a knowledge giver as such. That's not, I try to uh, put that off from my uh, educator practice. Uh, but then the, the, the pandemic, one of the opportunities it allows for is that the rethinking of our roles of as teachers. Um, because we would have to get off the pedestal of, uh, of knowing the most. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but then it's a struggle. Uh, it, it is largely a struggle because, because children can't move. There, there is there's all kinds of uh, crisis. Uh, in our school, there are uh, uh, children who have lost their parents uh, to the pandemic, and and uh, um, it, it is largely a, a, a very big uh, challenge. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jaya. Uh, with that, um, we would close uh, this session. Um, I would request uh, people who are attending, who are still here, to switch on your cameras for two seconds so that we can all take a happy picture. Um, uh, and it'll be lovely to see who stuck around and who's been here and listening. <laughs> uh, so if those who are here, can, 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 you please, um, can you please switch on your videos for a quick group picture. And uh, Bharat will let me know once we're done.
Yes, it's done. Thank you. Um, uh, Yuan, would you um, like to have any last words? Thanks um, for patiently, um, you know, answering a lot of important questions. So would you? Well, I'm. I, I want to say thank you as well for 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 giving this platform and and for this group, uh, and and for the interactions. I'm also going back with with uh, a number of questions, um, which I'll kind of pursue, which has emerged from from this discussion. So, thanks a lot for for uh, enabling this and and having me. Uh, thank you, Yuan. Um, I'm sorry if there were any questions that I may have missed. Uh, I, uh, with your permission, Yuvan, uh, if I could share your email ID uh, so that people can write to you. Uh, so I'm putting Yuvan's email ID in the chat box. If anyone wants to carry forward the conversation, can do so and write to Yuvan um, and he will uh, respond to you. Uh, thank you all for uh, being part of this. Uh, I can see a lot of... Um, uh, students, uh, people from school also being part of this. And I'm so happy to see um, so many faces across all uh, age groups being part of this. And uh, uh, it was lovely having all of you. I would also like to um, personally thank the organizing team. Um, you have uh, Sudha and Shruti and Bharat and Sindhura and Priyansh um, uh, and Jonathan. Um, and uh, it's, it's been uh, great. And uh, we have a next session soon in the next half an hour on human rights and rights for nature. And if anyone, and we have uh, uh, Shomi and uh, Shristi who will be talking about rights for nature. Um, and uh, Shristi has been talk will talk about um, rights for nature from the Indian context, uh, trying to understand um, whether uh, we, we do we really need uh, rights for nature and rights for river, particularly in the Indian context? And Yomi is going to briefly talk about the Colombian context and whatever is happening in Colombia. Um, so thank you all. Uh, I hope you've had a wonderful session. Um, I, I would like to um, have a quick round of trying to see uh, what everyone feels. So I'm just going to... Uh, Put a aha slide again if everyone's up for it. Um, or you can also just um, just just uh, give me two minutes. Um, we have the aha slide. Jonathan has just put. Can you? Everyone can go there. Um, requesting Bharat to share the screen. Um, can everyone access the aha slide? One. I think uh, in these days, in the age of Zoom, all of these are part and parcel. Technical difficulties are part and parcel of Zoom sessions. So please uh, don't mind us. And, um, give us two minutes. Um, so, sorry, the next slide, I think. It'll... So, maybe it's not. Okay, it's all right. Um, maybe I'll just put it here. Uh, you can put it in the chat box. I think it's not working. Uh, what does everyone feel right now? How, how, what is, how do you feel right now? Okay, oh, it's working. Yes. So how is everyone feeling right now? Queasy. <laughs> you. I'm so sorry. Maybe everyone can go have a lime juice after this. Very good, happy, great.
very nice session, helpful. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to Yuan. Ignorant. I think it's a good place to start somewhere. <laughs> so being aware of it. Uh, good talk, learn something good, knowledgeable. Um, thank you. Um, so maybe uh, the next slide. Uh, you one answered very well, aware. So we quickly move on to the next slide, Bharat. So in your opinion, how can youth engage with education and biodiversity conservation? So uh, this was just your understanding. So it's really nice to see that a lot of people have written field exposure, planting more trees, get out, observe, report, learning by doing with citizen science, conservation around home, amazing, wonderful, uh, conservation of nature, sensitization of issues, immersive. So um, I think uh, we've all learned uh, something about the need to step out and um, uh, be more in sync with nature. And that's uh, only going to start when we start doing things from ground up. And Yuan has shared those examples and why the need for it is absolutely um, important at this moment and this juncture that we all are at. When we are forced to be stuck at home and uh, you know, you really value um, nature, especially in these times. So uh, thank you all. Um, thank you for your lovely, um, you know, inputs and questions and being part of all of this. And uh, from the uh, Gibbon India team, we would like to thank you, Juan, for uh, giving us all their time and energy into this. Uh, thank you, Juan. And thank you all. And uh, we will start the next session in half, not half now, maybe 25 minutes. Bharat, over to you. Thank you so much, Priti. Thank you so much for moderating. And uh, it was really a wonderful session. And I'm ho I hope that most of the uh, participants uh, uh, learn something from here and we will try to engage with them. And thank you, Yuan, uh, for joining the session. Uh, and uh, we will try to interact more. Uh, yeah, I think in next 25 minutes, we, are, we will have another session. Uh, it's the same link, whoever also applied, registered for that session, uh, you can join that session, which will start in 25 minutes from now. It will be really interesting. You will understand about human rights, what type of rights and rights of nature from our wonderful speakers. So we will be looking forward to you seeing there. And uh, thank you so much for joining. You all have a great day.